The financial system has seen some tough years, but it has coped with the challenges perhaps even better than many of us expected. Fast forward to today, and inflation is coming down, but there could be bumps in the road ahead. Add to that growing geopolitical risks and the unstoppable rise of artificial intelligence, and you'll see that the financial system still has a lot to contend with. So how capable is our financial system of withstanding shocks, which is basically the definition of financial stability? You're listening to the ECB podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Stefania Secola. I'm joined today by our regular guest, John Fell, who works on our Financial Stability Review, which we publish twice a year. We'll be talking about the latest issue that just came out. John, great to see you again. Hi, Stefania. Uh, great to be back. John, the financial system was hit by several challenges in recent years. The pandemic and energy crisis just being two examples. And these challenges raise major concerns for financial stability. But when I read the latest issue of the Financial Stability Review, or as you call it in short, FSR, the tone strikes me as somewhat more positive. So what's changed? Yes, uh, your reading of the tone is indeed correct. Uh, we do have a more positive assessment this time. Um, the last couple of years have been challenging, uh, with plenty of indications that the euro area financial cycle has gone through a marked contraction. But this has happened without triggering a financial crisis, and that's really a positive. Yes. And the reason for that is resilience, especially, you were talked about shocks, ability to absorb shocks. It's, it's especially the resilience of households and firms' balance sheets. Um, despite the big buildup of debt during the pandemic, firms and households are actually less indebted today on average than they were before COVID-19 arrived on the scene. Huh. Now, that's partly thanks to the support that was provided by the public sector during those challenging times. Mm -hmm. um, and the composition of debt has also changed. Firms and households managed to lock in very low interest rates during the pandemic. And so that means that lending rates that are being paid on the outstanding loans, so the loans that were taken out during COVID, have risen more gradually than the headline rates that we see being quoted for new loans. Mm -hmm. And you remember last year, uh, we did endure uh, some spillover from the stresses in US and, 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 the, and the Swiss banking sectors. Yeah. But it was very short lived. And I think that was thanks to the strength of capital and liquidity buffers of euro area banks and the significant improvement of bank profitability. Mm -hmm. And because of all this and because non-financial sector balance sheets have for the most part been resilient to sharp interest rate hikes, the resilience of the banking sector was never really put to the test um, in this interest rate cycle. Okay. Now, in turn, that together with other factors such as corporate pricing power, lags and in wage increases, uh, that ensured uh, resilience of, of corporate sector profitability, allowing firms then to hoard or keep labor uh, when economic activity weakened. So in a sense, there was a, a mutual reinforcement of resilience between households and firms. And that meant that some of the concerns that we had for financial stability, thankfully, didn't materialize. Uh, I sense a but in your words, John. Yes, there was a but between the <laughs> lines. Uh, preparing this issue of the FSR was a lot more challenging than usual. And that's because some of the developments that have transpired since the November issue, um, well, they could be viewed positively. I described some of them already from a financial stability perspective, but others have been negative. Now, while vulnerabilities might be easing, much of our financial stability discussions these days are preoccupied with possible shocks. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no, and unfortunately, there's no shortage of possibilities yeah. of things that could go wrong. Uh, so they include, um, when we look at our core business, they include a macro outlook, which remains uncertain, and inflation, which is lower, but not yet low enough, uh, leaving room for disappointments. And then there is the big known, unknown uh, geopolitical risks, which have the potential to derail improving macro financial conditions. So bottom line, uh, our assessment is that sources of risk and vulnerability for financial, for financial stability have eased, but the outlook is fragile. Uh, in a more precise technical language, we could say that the central scenario has improved, but tail risks, downside tail risks have increased. 
And while we still think that the deliberate efforts that have been taken to fortify capital and liquidity buffers within the banking system have positioned it well to face higher risks, there really is no room for complacency. Yes, and and I see you have included in the FSR a special feature on geopolitics. So we're living in a world with more conflict and tension, uh, like Russia's unjustified invasion of Ukraine, conflict in the Middle East, fears of escalation in the US-China tensions over Taiwan, and all these uh, raise concerns for geopolitical stability. Now, first and foremost, conflicts have a human cost that is tragic and devastating. But John, your latest issue has also looked at what geopolitical risk can mean for financial stability. Tell us what you found and what you're going to keep a close eye on. So last time we spoke in general terms uh, about the economic and financial channels through which geopolitical risk can affect financial stability. We had um, um, the conflict in in the Middle East had just started at that time. But in the meantime, we dug uh, a bit deeper into the topic. Uh, The special feature on geopolitical risk is, I think, a rather comprehensive overview, reporting findings from several empirical analysis uh, that my colleagues did. Now, among the aspects examined, it looks at economic and financial market impacts, as well as impacts on individual banks and on non-bank financial institutions. So confirming what we discussed last time, we now have empirical evidence which actually shows that when geopolitical risk rises, it raises inflation. Uh And it also slows economic activity in the euro area. But I think for financial stability, three findings are worth special mention. So first, geopolitical events such as conflicts and international tensions can cause significant instability in financial markets. Now, usually these events lead to greater uncertainty. And in so doing, uh, this heightens market volatility and then it leads to sharp drops in asset prices. It also causes investors to shift uh, towards safer assets, such as uh, sovereign bonds. Mm -hmm. So that means that geopolitical tensions really can affect everyone, from the largest investment funds to pension funds to individual investors. Second, uh, non-bank financial institutions, uh, such as investment funds, they're found to be particularly vulnerable to geopolitical risks. So when geopolitical tensions rise, they tend to experience rapid and substantial outflows of capital. Now, if they don't have sufficient cash balances on hand, that can lead to strains because it might force these funds, if they don't have the cash, to sell assets so that they can give investors their money back. Um, and so so-called forced sales like this could cause even further downward pressure on asset prices, potentially creating destabilizing adverse feedback loops. Mm-hmm. And third, our work also shows that banks with weaker capitalization and low profitability levels are disproportionately affected by geopolitical risks. Those banks tend to experience larger increases in their funding costs, uh, reductions in their asset quality, and significant declines in their stock prices, illustrating really a pronounced sensitivity to geopolitical instability. So in a nutshell, um, geopolitical risk can pose a threat for financial stability. Uh, Well, we think it's unlikely that it could cause a systemic crisis unless it exposed deeper vulnerabilities within the financial system. Now, as to what we are looking out for right now, I should emphasize that we're not geopolitical experts, um, but we are monitoring developments in all of the potential geopolitical hotspots uh, that you just mentioned. And what can banks and other financial institutions do in the face of this risk? But our main message here is that preparedness and diversification are crucial uh, in preventing adverse geopolitical developments from triggering financial crisis. Mm -hmm. Financial institutions have a role to play in this, and so do uh, prudential policy authorities. Uh, Both must be proactive in monitoring geopolitical risks and in preparing for potential impacts. And there's actually a lot that financial institutions can do. They can diversify their investments. Um, They can also ensure that they have strong liquidity positions for the reasons that I just mentioned, Mm -hmm. just in case depositors or investors need or want to access their savings in a hurry. Uh, Some financial institutions might even be able to purchase geopolitical risk insurance. Now, other crucial preparation strategies include regular stress testing that can be carried out by the institutions themselves or they could be they could be over exercises overseen by authorities. And these can reveal any weaknesses in risk management 
and they can help with contingency planning. Uh, so uh, identifying and addressing any of those weaknesses uh, should ensure that geopolitical ev- events don't threaten financial stability. Interesting. Uh, and this issue is really full of uh, interesting uh, topics no, in, in your FSR. And one of them is AI, artificial intelligence. We've talked about AI a few times on the podcast. And dear listeners, you can find the links to those episodes in the show notes. But John, your colleagues looked at a different angle this time, the impact of AI on financial stability. Technology has seen huge leaps forward. Just think of the advances in generative AI like ChatGPT, for example. Now, the use of these tools in the financial system is growing, and this brings benefit, but also risks. So, John, how can AI be used in the financial system? Can you give us some concrete examples? So, even though it's a very challenging question to answer, Stefani, I'm glad you asked about the benefits. Um, Our financial stability review is not a financial instability review, and that's for good reason. (laughs) Uh, It does devote a lot of space to risks, and it does that with the intention of mitigating them and safeguarding financial stability. Technological breakthroughs have played an important role in supporting this objective in the past, and we expect that they will continue continue doing so. The question is challenging, though, because we really only have about 18 months of experience with mass use Mm -hmm. of generative artificial intelligence, and people are coming up with new use cases every day. Yeah, yeah. What we're discovering is that the limit for this technology seems to be the limits of the human imagination. (laughs) That raises the risk that listeners to this this podcast 10 years from now, say, might find our predictions naive (laughs) and even amusing. Still, uh, I think we can already take a stab at it. Drawing upon a wide range of information about how it's being used or how experts think it might be used, Uh, Our special feature lists several potential benefits uh, for revenue generation, for cost savings, and for risk management. So if I just go through a few of those, starting with um, revenue generation, uh, AI has the potential to improve product to customer matching. Uh, It can do that through more efficient analysis of diverse uh, customer data, Mm -hmm. targeting services better towards those who need them uh, through, for instance, chatbots. Uh, Now, if that's done well, that has the potential to improve customer satisfaction and even customer uh, retention. Uh, as for cost saving, it can be deployed uh, to automate routine, routine tasks and entire work streams. It can also improve efficiencies in internal processes such as automated text preparation or even drafting computer code, yeah. uh, an area where uh, AI seems to be improving by the day. And then there's risk management. AI can manage data more effectively and it it can enhance key functions such as fraud detection uh, and capital planning. That can lead to more accurate assessments and better informed decisions. It can also support compliance uh, with regulations by enhancing monitoring and reporting capabilities. Uh, And so that will reduce for banks and other financial institutions the risk of being confronted with non-compliance penalties. So clearly there are lots of good use cases But as I said before, I also see risks. You mentioned a minute ago a chatbot, if done well, could help a lot, but might also misadvise a customer, for example, or a bank could make a decision based on an AI prediction and make a loss. Of course, human beings can make the same mistakes, but the difference is that AI can make them systemic, I would say. And that is all uh, what financial stability is about, no? Looking at the financial system as a whole. John, can you expand on this for us? So a key question here is whether AI simply creates new ways for old sources of systemic risk to materialize uh, or whether it introduces brand new sources of risk. So, for example, there's no doubt that it has the potential to create new and faster ways of spreading contagion. Yeah. Or for example, rumors that have adverse effects on markets. That's a given, I think, and not a new source of risk. Uh, what we've tried to do in the special feature is think through the consequences of some totally new sources of risk that AI might bring. Mm-hmm. And the conclusion that we reached is that if there is widespread adoption of AI tools within the financial system, and we really have no, be- no reason to believe that that won't be, the case, Mm -hmm. then if the number of AI suppliers is small and concentrated, operational risk may increase. Operational risk is a a wide domain, but it it also includes cyber risk, uh, which could increase as well. 
Nowadays, we often speak about the strengths that diversity brings. Well, financial stability relies heavily on diversity, uh, diversity of views, diversity of objectives, diversity of horizon even. So if AI reduces diversity, which, for example, many banks using similar AI models for trading, a fault or a bias in these models could lead to synchronized errors, amplifying market volatility and leading to significant uh, financial instability. Uh, in addition, AI raises market concentration and too big to fail concerns. So on the risk of everybody using the same tools, no, what comes to my mind is like if there are several telephone networks, but most of us use um, the same telephone. So basically almost all the people say, use the same telephone network and something goes wrong, we are all cut off. Yeah, so that's a good example. And we've seen plenty of cases of winner takes all firms in the information technology industry. They're household names, you know them. Yeah. Uh, and with economies of scale, there is a view that we could el also end up with a small number of artificial uh, intelligence suppliers. Yeah. Now, if that happens, then many institutions might end up relying on a limited number of AI suppliers, as, mm -hmm. it, uh, as you said. And with that concentration, if one major provider was confronted with a technical failure, say, or a cyber attack, yeah. that could disrupt the services of many financial institutions simultaneously. Yeah. So one could imagine a scenario uh, where a leading AI provider system crashes. Uh, that could then hold trading activities, affecting loan approvals, disrupting customer services across multiple banks and causing maybe even widespread panic and financial disruption. Yes. AI could also create a market environment where only the largest financial institutions who can afford to make investments in AI thrive. Now, this is firms have building their own AI. Uh, a concentration of power like that could lead to too big to fail scenarios uh, where the failure of one large institution could pose a severe risk to the entire financial system. For example, if a major bank was relying heavily on AI for trading in the financial markets and it faced a critical system failure, that could trigger a market crash. Yeah. And then I think this is one that a lot of people speak about, uh, the issue of what I would call distorted information processing. Uh, AI systems analyze and, and interpret vast amounts of data to make decisions. If many institutions use similar AI systems, that might lead them to reach the same conclusions and react similarly to market events, so resulting in, in herd behavior. So for example, uh, if, the AI model, if the AI models were to predict a drop in stock prices and all institutions start selling their stocks simultaneously, that could lead to a market crash, even if the initial prediction of the model was wrong. Wow, wow. And so this becomes a, an artificial intelligence group think, basically, same risk. So where do we stand now, John, and how close are these risks? Right now, I think it's fairly safe to say that these risks are not imminent. Uh, and whether they become material or, material or not very much depends on how widely and how rapidly AI is adopted. So I think there should be time for monitoring and making regulatory adjustments to address the risks uh, that, that, that current frameworks uh, may not cover, and I'm sure we will find things. Uh, first and foremost, this will require close monitoring of levels of technological penetration and of the supplier concentration that I just spoke of. Okay. And uh, so if I understand correctly, AI risk is the one where maybe we need to keep the closest eye on. Am I right? Well, AI does raise some fairly fundamental issues about financial stability, uh, the public good nature of it, so to speak. Arguably, there's hardly a day that goes by where when, when one doesn't see a newspaper article dealing with the ethical and the trust issues raised by, by AI. Yes. Trust is at the very foundation of safeguarding financial stability and loss of trust can cause panic. Yeah. These issues will need close scrutiny and further exploration to ensure uh, the public confidence in the financial system remains strong if AI is widely adopted. Yeah. Thanks so much, John. Before we wrap up, we always have a question that we ask all our guests on the podcast, and that's for a hot tip linked to the topic we discussed today, so financial stability. I know you put a lot of thoughts into your hot tips, John. So what do you have for our listeners today? So on this one, I thought even more than usual. And in <laughs> the end, uh, I decided against offering a tip 
uh, about existential implications of artificial intelligence. <laughs> we all know the movies. Uh, there's no shortage, of ma- no shortage of material available on this aspect of yes. the internet and elsewhere. Instead, I found an excellent TED talk uh, by Sasha Lucioni. You tell me if I pronounce that correctly. Sasha Lucioni, yes. Lucioni, an AI ethics researcher. Now, her talk entitled, her talk was entitled "AI is dangerous, but not for the reasons you think." Ah. And it covers a range of negative impacts of AI that are already apparent. So we just talked about future risks. She's looking at what risks are actually now materializing. And it includes large carbon emissions of large language models, mm-hmm. infringement of copyright, ah, yes. and the spreading of biased information. Wow. And this brings us to the end of this episode, John. Uh, I want to thank you, John Fell, for updating us on financial stability outlook. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Dear listeners, check out the show notes for more on this topic. You've been listening to the ECB podcast with Stefania Secola. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. And in the spirit of Europe, we end in Bulgarian today. And I'd like to say, Until next time, thanks for listening.